when I presented at Velo City, I talked about um, what I'd read from a Dutch approach is to talk about the orgware hardware and software. Yeah. Um, so the, the hardware is the cycling infrastructure that we ride on. The software are things like the guidelines, the funding, the standards, all those things. Um, and the orgware is really the organizational approach. So that's having the political willpower. It's having the advocacy organizations working together. And I talked about those three, but what I've realized is that, that so there's a little Venn diagram with those three sort of areas in it. What was missing is that sitting outside all of that is the paradigm. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Sarah Stace uh, from Sydney, Australia. She is the director of city at WSP and she's also involved with Better Streets and the World Cycling Alliance. And we recently met up in Velo City. And we're gonna be reflecting on some of the things that really were quite great takeaways from Velo City for her and uh, really why she has a fire in the belly to really kind of move things forward with a sense of urgency uh, in terms of creating environments which are more walkable, bikeable for all ages and abilities. Uh, so let's get right to it with Sarah Stace. Sarah, so wonderful to see you once again. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Sarah, I love to have my guests just uh, say a few words about themselves. So who is Sarah? Uh, okay, well, um, first I'm going to start with what we call in Australia an acknowledgement of country. So I'm acknowledging that I'm joining today from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Now we do this because uh, our land has never been ceded and so... Uh, that's where I'm joining you from today. About myself, I'm actually a registered architect. I work in a global engineering company called WSP, where I'm the director of cities in Australia. And then I'm also the president of Better Streets, which is an alliance of a whole lot of organisations who really want to have those better street outcomes from people who walk, people who cycle, climate change groups and so on. And then I'm also the treasurer of the World Cycling Alliance, which is based in Brussels and uh, is sort of partnered with the European Cycling Federation. So that's a bit about uh, the various bits and pieces that I do. Um, my, I've worked for 25 years in private sector, as well as all three levels of government, so federal, state and local governments. And I'm really passionate about how we get those better street outcomes as part of our everyday living to get people active and outdoors. And I think that helps people's mental health and physical health. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, we won't spend very much time uh, over on the corporate website, but I do want to uh, pop over and just uh, acknowledge that, yes, uh, your official role there is you're the director of cities uh, at, at WSP. And uh, you mentioned Better Streets. So uh, here's the landing page uh, for that. And uh, I was fascinated to see uh, this Better Streets. Now, it's, it, it looks like it really is truly a coalition of many, many different community groups. Um, how did this all come about? Was this recent? Yeah, it is very recent. We actually only launched in November last year. Okay. And we... Really, it's based on a model that um, one of our members worked on in London, in the UK, where she did her PhD on better streets and how you can have, I guess, that community activism, but joining a whole lot of voices together as an alliance. So the idea behind this is that we often, when we talk about walking or we talk about cycling, often it's just the one voice or it's seen as this one voice. And so we realise that actually we can be much, much more powerful if we all join together. And if you just scroll up a little bit, you had the um, key asks there. Yeah. So we did these together. So they weren't, um, it wasn't a top down. This is really coming from the, the ground up about, well, what are the key asks? What are we asking for when we're joining together as an alliance? And so this first one is talking about setting those lifelong habits for kids. In this case, by having 75% of children to walk, cycle, scoot, or catch public transport to school. Um, now that's, that's where it used to be um, back in the seventies, but is clearly not the case in Australia anymore. So we've sort of set that as a stretch target. 
The second one is that we want kids to be safe and independent, and that's through adopting 30 kilometre hour street speeds on all residential streets and in urban centres. And again, that's um, a street a speed that is survivable. If a, if a person is hit by a car, they're going to survive. Um, my own child actually got hit by a car walking to school about a year ago, and he's fine, um, but that's because the car was driving slowly. So we want right. our streets to be survivable. And then the third one is supporting local businesses by improving and expanding those streetscapes like outdoor dining that we saw happening a lot during COVID. The fourth one is um, sort of upgrading pedestrian crossings and improving that pedestrian access. And then the fifth one is building cycleway infrastructure at a, at a network level. So because we've sort of set out those key asks, anyone who signs up to our um, coalition basically is agreeing with those key asks, but they could be a climate change action group. They could be a school or a group of parents or, um, yeah, so that, that there's lots of different groups who could join that as long as they agree on what those key asks are. And that can be really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess channel. as an example, we are. Uh, <laughs> Active towns. I need to sign on to this. <laughs> this is yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, for example, we did go – Oh, I was just going to say, and I'll speak later about going and talking to the Australian government and different state governments and so on. It's given us a foot in the door. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And I noticed, too, you you know, with the 30 kilometer per hour uh, for all local, um, the local residential streets and urban centers, do you have that same challenge in Australia that we have in North America where they have cited schools outside of the residential areas and outside of the urban areas. They've, they've like put schools off on their own. And oftentimes the schools are on dangerous streets. They're on high speed corridors and, and arterials. Did, did that happen, uh, you know, for you guys as well? Possibly not to the same extent. It depends on where it's located. So we've right. got existing built up areas. We have a, a very strong, what they call a, a public school network, so so primary schools basically. And if you're going right. to your your primary school, that's kind of your um, age five to eleven, mm-hmm. then it's going to be in your local area. So you can't go out of area if you're going to a public primary school. Um, right. And so all of those are walkable because right. that's a set area. Like my local school, it's about a five hundred meter catchment. It's not very big. Um, whereas the high schools, definitely, we went through a whole era where we just closed the public high schools and joined them all together into these super schools. Um, in in my area, there's one uh, public high school to serve an absolutely enormous catchment. Um, mm. And so uh, the problem then is that everyone's sort of moved towards private schools and private schools have no catchment requirement whatsoever. So it's, it has created this massive travel demand. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you hit the nail on the head there. It's created a massive travel demand because not only are those schools located in areas that may not be walkable and bikeable, but the distance start being, you know, longer. And so now you are inducing the demand of driving, uh, you know, the parents driving the kids to the school or, or somehow they're having to get on buses or, or whatever. So um, it yeah. seems to be a worldwide phenomena and it's a huge challenge, I think, you know. Because then you have, you know, uh, an in, inflow of so many cars to that school area, which should be inherently walkable and bikeable and kid friendly. Yeah, and I think also um, for particularly in their teenage years, this is where you start to set lifelong habits about travel. And so mm-hmm. if you create this situation where kids literally just cannot walk and definitely can't cycle to school, when are they going to learn that habit? Um, whereas for me, and I think for a lot of um, people of our sort of age, is that we did ride to school and that became a lifelong habit and then we rode to work and it just continues on from there. So when do we expect that's going to happen for our kids? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll pop over here uh, before we uh, dive into some of the, the materials that you sent over. You mentioned the World Cycling Alliance. Why don't you, uh, you know, sort of share uh, with, you know, from a 30,000 foot level, what the World Cycling Alliance is all about? 
Yeah, so the World Cycling Alliance really started, I think, in around 2014, actually, when Australia last hosted VeloCity is when we launched the World Cycling Alliance. So um, our secretariat function is provided by the European Cycling Federation. And so it's an equivalent to that, but on a global level. Um, our members comprise, um, I guess, each continent across the world. So we've got a, an African, we've got a South American, North American, um, I'm Oceana, um, and Asian, East Asian. Asian and um, Central Asian. So we've got um, each of our board members represents one of those continents and then we are essentially that global voice for cycling and again trying to amplify that message about how what, what are the benefits, um, how do we bring about that change globally. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the European Cyclist Federation um, and uh, we just saw each other. We were, you know, together at, at uh, the Velo City in um, in Leipzig, Germany, uh, which is just south of uh, Berlin. And uh, and you all were are interested in bringing Velo City back down under to, to Australia. I'll talk a little bit about this this campaign. So this is for for 2026. Yeah, so we are thinking about bringing Velo City to Sydney in Australia. And um, what we did at that Velocity conference in Leipzig was to run this survey, which anyone can, it's still open if anyone wants to fill that out. We were just curious about what would it take to invite people here? What are the barriers? Um, we noticed in Europe that there's a lot of concern about flying because of climate change, um, but what would excite people and invite them to come over? So we were just collecting surveys and information on that while we were there. And I'll make sure that we have the the link uh, in both the uh, the audio and the video uh, version of this uh, podcast episode, so that folks can um, you know fill that survey out and, and get that going. Uh, now that was my first Velo City conference, uh, and, and it, I was just blown away. I really do. Uh, believe that it's so incredibly important that we have this global platform uh, to meet, to talk through these issues. Um, I'm assuming that you've attended more than one Velo City. I have, yes. My first one was in Adelaide in Australia in 2014. And then I went to one in Nantes in France. And so this was my third one. Okay, fantastic. When you look at what we have, our challenge that we're, we have in front of us in in I, I have a sense that we're going to focus in on this because there's a level of urgency that needs to be put forward on these issues that we have. We it, it, The transformations that we need to do, the work that we have in front of us. Um, I get the sense that, you know, when we look at cops, the, you know, the cop meeting and, 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 you know, these, these people get coming together to talk about this stuff, it's just not moving, you know, quickly enough. And so that's why I'm so incredibly um, encouraged by Velo City and, uh, and, and the organizations like the World Cycling Alliance and the European Cyclist Federation that are, you know, they're, they're just on it. They're, they're keeping the pressure up and, and, you know, saying, hey, don't forget about active mobility. We can't just be continuing to focus on technology and and the whiz bang uh, techno solutions of the day. Um, I mean, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Is, is that sort of where where you and your group is is also coming from when you think about? I'm assuming it is because when I look at this. I'm not seeing a whole lot of uh, in the in the vision or the asks here. I'm not seeing a whole lot of techno techno uh, whiz bang stuff going on in there. Well, e-bikes, we do love e-bikes um, and uh, yeah. you know, cargo yeah. bikes and things like that are all part of that mix, I suppose. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah, what I wanted to reflect on, which, I, which obviously we'll get to, is um, I did a lot of soul searching while we're at Velo City and immediately afterwards because I spend a week um, after that in the Netherlands and in Copenhagen in Denmark and then um, got back home and got this amazing presentation about China which we'll also talk about and it's got me really thinking about our paradigm that we have in North America and in Australia that's holding us back like 
Yes, it's really lovely to go to Velo City. And a lot of people talk about having, um, you know, the post Velo City blues. I don't have the blues. I am, I've got fire in my belly. It's like, I could tell. <laughs> how can we be here and see this? You know, here's someone here with a cane on the back of his bike. Like, this is someone living with a disability, and the bike is giving him the freedom to just get out and do stuff. And I'm assuming this is Copenhagen. Yeah. And so this was after uh, Velo City, you continued on. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a couple of other uh, images as well in there. This one here is a couple of teenagers just getting out there on their bikes. It's a very um, nice, well-to-do neighborhood with fancy shops. Um, and here's just some teenagers going for a ride. Um, I have realized why Van Moof makes that really strong crossbar is so you can take a friend with you. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, it, and And it's so funny to see uh, this happening. Cause whenever you're in the Netherlands, especially, and I'm assuming this is the Netherlands. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you see the kids, uh, you know, dinking, you know, this, the, the gal here on, on the left, looking at her phone, she's about ready to sit down once the, the, they get rolling again and she'll, she'll sort of dink on the, the back, uh, rack there too. So, and that's one of the things that I love about, being in the Netherlands, being in Europe is when you start to see that cycling is is not something special. It's just it's pedestrian plus, as my friend uh, Chris Bruntlett likes to say. It's just a, a, a practical, pragmatic way of getting around. But it's also inherently social and fun. And, you know, you, it's great when you see the girls giggling and, and, and boys, too. And I, it's just really, really encouraging when you're in that environment. Yeah, but I, I, I want to take it further than that. So sure. um, that, that image that you just showed of the girls, um, you know, they're heading off to hockey on a Sunday yeah. morning. And, oh, yeah. um, but the thing is they're, they're on a road. Um, yeah. Well, they're on a cycleway next to the road and yeah, yeah. they're relaxed. You know, yes. the one in the front, actually, she's got a um, yeah, AirPods in her ear. Yeah, they're yeah. just chatting. One's on a phone. They're, they're, they're amongst traffic, but they are not stressed. They're not even looking at the cars. It doesn't matter. That That's the kind of the environment that's been created that is so safe, so supportive, so welcoming that you have got no problems letting your teenage girls get out and they've just got their hockey stick in one hand and phone in the other. Like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's just, yeah. That just blows I'm, my mind, just that image I'm right really there. I'm really glad that you, you mentioned that specifically because – you do notice that difference as soon as you go to, you know, some of the emerging cycling cities, especially over in Europe, uh, like London and Paris, um, you, you're starting to see some really impressive numbers of people riding, but it's not as relaxed. This is really, I mean, it, 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 again, pedestrian plus, this is like super, super casual, super relaxed. It doesn't seem like when you're getting on a bike, to run an errand or, or go to work or go to school or go to field hockey practice like these girls are, um, it doesn't feel like it's a race. It doesn't feel like it's a competition. It doesn't feel like you're having to, you know, do battle with the environment. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I think that's incredibly important to, to normalizing this beyond a very, very small niche of our overall population. If we want to have big change, you have to create an environment that is truly safe and inviting to everyone so that they can feel like they can be relaxed out there. That's right. And certainly when I ride a bike, I assume that every car, every motorist is going to kill me. Right. You Which know? is like very, very stressful. Riding. That's yeah. <laughs> stressful. That, that's, it's awful. that's incredibly stressful to, to have that assumption. Yeah. And luckily I do have um, separated cycleways pretty much my whole way to work. So I can comfortably commute, but every intersection I'm worried, I'm looking, I'm alert. Whereas those girls are not, they don't need to be. Um, and I guess that's, that's that paradigm that um, there was a, a great quote that Emmanuel John, who's, who's one of my fellow board members on the World Cycling Alliance, he was part of um, one of the plenaries. Um, and he said, that you can't tell a fish to live on the mountain. And what he meant by that is we're all a fish. And those girls that we just saw, the people in the Netherlands and in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, they're on the mountain, but we don't even know the mountain exists. Um, and I guess that's where I'm sort of um, was coming to is our paradigm is the river where the fish swimming around and we don't know the mountain exists except sometimes we go on a holiday and we kind of like, Oh wow. Like, 
wow, it, it does exist. But then we just come back home, we're just depressed <laughs> about, uh, or we just couldn't have that here. And um, and, and I found uh, that quote. Yeah. I found that quote here on your your slide presentation from your learnings, uh, and it is in fact the the same uh, image with the with the girls. So I I, I definitely wanted That's to give right. Emmanuel yeah, just cut, uh, credit uh, for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and uh, the other one he said is that we need to put that fire in the tail of people to change the whole system, not just part of the system, it's the whole system. And um, I guess actually, if you want to pop back a couple of slides, I can uh, take you through this because there was some really interesting insights um, uh, here. Actually, we'll just start with this one. So um, this is actually uh, after the conference and came back to Australia. I was asked to be part of a presentation on. What we learned from Velo City, and um, this is what I, the slide deck that I gave, and the, there was a particular quote um, that I think it was Rodney. No, was was it Rodney Ellis? I can't remember who gave that one. Who, who, Some um, people will get mad, really mad. Yeah, that's right. But yeah. I, I, actually, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But if we just yeah. go to that first slide again in, yeah. in Copenhagen. So the quote was to, I'll, I'll come remember who said it in a moment, to be realistic, demand the impossible. Uh, yeah. And okay. uh, I've been really reflecting on what that meant. And so this is a photograph in, in Copenhagen. It's it's near the cycle snake, um, but a little bit further up. And this is a traffic intersection. But if you look at it closely, there is no room for cars. It's all bikes. Like there's a blue stripe going right through the middle of the intersection. There's logos everywhere. There's you know space for pedestrians because they've got uh, the the zebra crossings there. But where are the cars meant to go? They're actually stuck on the fringe. Like this is completely inverted and flipped the street the other way. So for us, this is totally impossible, and yet it exists because right there. Um, and so the next couple of slides actually go through some of that. Um, so this one here, again, we just looked at that photograph, but um, this is from the closing plenary um, saying that that as advocates, whether that's from the Better Streets or other organisations, that um, we need to say the things that politicians and bureaucrats can't say and that we can't just stand on the sidelines. We need to be sort of political, I suppose, and, and activate that. Um, but again, here's that photo of it's completely impossible where we are in, in North America or in Australia, and yet it's it's right here. It happens. Um, if we flip to the next one. Yeah. Let me ask you this real quick. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Why can't they say these things? Why is it hard why for, can't for politicians? the... Yeah. Why can't the politicians and leaders say these things? I mean... Is it just political suicide if they say the things that have to be said? Yeah, it is. Um, so an example in Australia is there's a, a, a Lord Mayor. Um, so a Lord Mayor sort of is in charge of that, that sort of central part of the, the city. Um, each of our capital cities has a Lord Mayor. And one of them, Clover Moore, has been the Lord Mayor for, I think, since 2004. She's extremely popular. But um, her whole platform has included cycling as part of a sustainable, livable city. Um, and she spent many years on the wrong side of history in, in the wilderness in Australia, where she was a real pariah for having this strong opinion. It's now paying off because we're now building all this infrastructure in Sydney. And we can look at some of those slides in a moment. But it's taken a long time to get to this point where she is on the right side of history. And I think that other politicians around Australia just look at what she's been through and they don't want to go down that path. And I, I wanted to ask that question because we, we do look to and we see examples of strong leadership um, like, you know, Mayor Anne Hildalgo in Paris and, you know, taking bold moves and saying, no, this is what we're doing. Uh, you voted me in on this platform and this is what we're doing. And I was serious. We're doing this. Uh, we don't see that very frequently here in the United States either. So I just wanted to, to clarify that, yeah, it is kind of political suicide for many people to, to say the bold things that need to be said of, you know, hey, we, you know, pants on fire. We have urgent things that need to be done and uh, we need to start demanding the impossible. Yeah, and I guess um, actually at Velo City, we did have one of Australia's politicians turned up, Rob Stokes. He was the Minister for Planning and then the Minister for Transport and had held another uh, bunch of portfolios. But his most recent one was the Minister for Cities and Active Transport. He actually put Active Transport in his title as a minister, which was amazing. But he also has just retired from politics. And so he came along to Velo City to, to find out more. Um, and that was amazing to have him there, but he was in for one year. 
And so uh, in that time, you know, did some really awesome stuff. But I guess the that because the paradigm is so stuck in this car centric obesogenic, that's sort of a, a, a environment, I can, it's very jargonistic, but essentially we create a society that, that makes it difficult for people to exercise and be healthy. And that, that was awesome. But then it's held back by things like the bureaucracy, for example, who just don't have that level of ambition. So it's, it takes so many parts of the ecosystem for that change to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of obesogenic, uh, down uh, just down the road from me um, in Harris County, uh, District 1 uh, Commissioner Rodney Ellis uh, in Houston was there, uh, also a former um, a guest here on the podcast. And uh, Rodney is, is, is one of the bright lights in the state of Texas uh, because he just, you know, is fed up with the fact that, uh, you know, too many people are, you know, unhealthy. They're, they're, they're becoming obese. The, uh, the diabetes rate is through the roof, uh, in, you know, his, his, uh, constituents down in uh, district one. And so it was really, really important, but he brings up a really interesting point here. And he has, uh, a, an interesting quote that I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about, cause it, it clearly, uh, had an impact on you too. It did. Yeah, here it is here. He said some people get really mad. Um, and that's right. People do. They get very angry because they see that the, you're taking something away. What you're taking away is their car. Um, and, you know, that makes sense because we've created this. So I work a lot in land use and transport, that that mix between um, uh, where we create travel demand, we create these environments where it is very hard to get around with anything but a car. Um, and so, of course, if you take that away from people, you're taking away their fundamental way to get around a city. That's fair enough. But then that's that whole paradigm where we need to change. Well, why do we create things this way? It doesn't have to be this way. Um, and Rodney also made a point that a lot of people can't drive. So I did the numbers in Australia and it turns out I was actually really shocked at this. 40% of our population can't drive. That's because their kids can't, they're too young to get a license or they're old, they're too old to get a license or they're living with a disability like this, this person here in the image um, or they choose to be car light because they want to live sustainably. So um, how to, So we're providing for 60% of the population and that doesn't even take into account people who can't afford a car um, or the costs of that. So I think that was a really valid point that Rodney made. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think one of the most important things that we can do is is acknowledge that we shouldn't be focusing on what people are going to have to give up, you know, in 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 this brighter future that we're imagining. And when we look at the the asks that you had that we were focusing on earlier, um, this is creating a better society. This is creating a society of choices, and so. I, we get so wrapped around the the political angle of of what we're losing and or, or you know as a society and that really kind of gets people you know into loggerheads and and you know an us versus them thing versus I'm starting to really trying to embrace the concept especially in America because man we're America we want freedom we want choice I'm like oh you want freedom you want choice have I got a deal for you it's called active mobility. Let's, you know, transform our, our communities so that they, you know, you can literally, you know, not be a slave to having to drive everywhere. Because that's one of the things that, that has happened with motordom, of course, historically, starting in the 1940s on, is the, the, the car was seen as freedom. Freedom to drive the open roads. You look at the commercials and it's all about, you know, you don't look at traffic jam, you know, cars and traffic jams. And you don't look at pollution. You don't look at, you know, climate change in the commercials. It's all about, you know, freedom and, and all that. So I really love this idea of trying to uh, emphasize the fact that, you know, having mobility choice and having the ability for the girls to be able to go out in a no stress environment and be able to have active mobility as a choice, whether it's walking, biking, taking transit, or even, you know, driving, you know, you, that's, I, I think something that is really, really uh, helpful to try to, um, to try to help 
alleviate or mitigate some of the knee jerk reactions where people feel like this is a you know fight or flight situation where they need to get mad. And so, yes, people are going to get mad no matter what we do. And some are going to get it really, really mad. And there's a subset of the population that, you know, creates a lot of noise, even though they're not very many, they're not a huge number of people, uh, but they, they have influence and they do scream loudly. Uh, but I think that if we can, you know, really lean into the fact that, you know, hey, what we're talking about here is empowering for many people of all ages and abilities. I think we can, you know, be much more successful as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I and, love the, oh, I yes. love this part of it too. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this um, that's actually a little cart full of babies is in Leipzig in Germany. Apparently, it's a it's actually a vestige of East Germany where this is very common. But here are some very very young children being t- taken on a bicycle in a trailer off to their daycare centre. So I love that image. And again, you know, it's completely impossible in in our society. But um, a, a mantra that kept on being said over and over in Velo City is that a good bike plan is a car plan. And saying that um, you can't build that cycling infrastructure if you don't manage cars and if you don't manage car parking. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because, um, again, we – in Australia, we, we've moved to this new era called movement in place where we're trying to sort of balance movement against place outcomes and so on. But at the end of the day, you have to be talking about trade-offs. You have to give up some car parking or you have to give up car flow. Um, if you don't make that trade-off, you're never going to get that cycleway in. Um, or if you do, you're spending, um, like we've just uh, put in a cycleway, it's beautiful, um, in, in Bondi Beach, near Bondi Beach, it's more than $15 million a kilometre. But that's because we couldn't trade off any car parking and we had to keep the traffic flow going. And so we had to actually crimp space away from pedestrians. It was the pedestrians who lost the space and we had to move the curbs and that meant we had to move some trees and we had to move the stormwater and we had to move electricity conduits and then the cost just blew out to uh, an enormous amount of money um, for a short section of cycleway. So it is beautiful, it is great but at a great cost. Um, And so we need to have these discussions about, well, what do we really want to trade off? And I also thought amongst this context was that Oslo, you know, in Norway, they love their electric vehicles. That's been very successful. But then they're also having to now say, well, yeah, that's great. You've got your EV, but it doesn't actually solve all of our problems. We're going to have to lose some parking, for example, and Paris has done the same in Ghent. Um, So when you look at I can't think of any cities globally that has been hugely successful with cycling infrastructure that hasn't given up some cars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some of that real estate. And, and again, it's not saying that we're going to ban cars, but at the same time, if you are looking to get some balance in terms of mobility, uh, as, as you pointed out in the image in, in the very first image, you know, here it, it's, you're rebalancing here. What, what are we, what are we incentivizing? What do we need to see more of? Oh, that's right. We need to see more sustainable transportation, more people walking, biking, taking transit. And so you start reallocating the space. It's not that you can't drive, you still can, and you, there will still be places for you to park somewhere, but it's not going to be as subsidized and as easy as it always has been in the past. And I think that that's a, an important uh, uh, thing to, to really hone in on is that, you know, the, it's, and, and, and I'm glad you brought up the, the 40% of the folks that, that um, are not driving. Uh, the, and, and I'm glad that you also said, you know, some of them is because they can't drive, but some of them is because they don't drive because they choose not to drive. Um, And it it was interesting because that came up in my episode with Kathy Tuttle, where she also talked about this. This was actually the whole name of that particular episode. uh, And she actually produced an entire report uh, for the city of Portland, Oregon about this, is that a a good bike plan is, is a car plan. And I would even go so far as to say, it, it's not about the bike. It's like a good city plan, a good public you know, realm plan, a livelihood and, and vibrancy plan for a community is to have a plan to manage the negative externalities of cars. And, and being honest about that impact that cars are in fact having. 
on the health and well-being of the city as well as the residents in the city. So good stuff. Now, this is huge. This is the new ter- paradigm. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, Philip Christ was on fire. Like I, I've heard him speak before and he's he's amazing, but he was just in there, uh, you know, like just blazing in his plenary session um, and it really took my breath away actually. And uh, he he's, works for the International Transport Forum as part of the OECD and he said we really need to take this deep, rooted human approach to our city. So I'm going to um, sort of repeat some of the things he said there. But one is that cars have appropriated our public space and our streets, which is just what we've been talking about, and that it's been taken away from life and put towards this fast movement. Um, And that we've, by doing this collective embracing of car dependence, we've shackled our suburbs um, and our humans to car dependency. And look, I I love this image on the right. This is taken in Copenhagen near the Super Killen um, and you've got a couple here where he's riding and she's in the, the little cabin in the front. Again, like I've never seen anything like this in Australia. I've certainly seen kids being carted around, but not a couple where um, that's sort of an elderly couple that this happens. And I guess what he was saying around our paradigm is that you, you, you can't just drop that bike infrastructure into a car-centric environment, a car-centric in society. And he talked also about taking cars away from our minds and away from our streets. And I just thought that was a really lovely analogy. But yeah, I think that's where we, that's the paradigm that we live in, in Australia and New Zealand and, and the US and, you know, all over the world, we're stuck in the cars have taken over our minds. And so we can't, this is that fish in the mountain component where we're stuck in this stream where we're surrounded by cars, they form our everyday existence. And so we can't imagine that life or a society or a city without those cars dominating the noise, dominating the space. I think that's that paradigm that we're really stuck in. So just to to give it a, um, we don't need to necessarily show the slides, but when I presented at Velo City, I talked about um, what I'd read from a Dutch approach is to talk about the orgware hardware and software. Um, So the, the hardware is the cycling infrastructure that we ride on. The software are things like the guidelines, the funding, the standards, all those things. Um, And the orgware is really the organisational approach. So that's having the political willpower. It's having the advocacy organisations working together. And I talked about those three. But what I've realised is that that, so there's a little Venn diagram with those three sort of areas in it. What was missing is that sitting outside all of that is the paradigm. Right. And so our parent, like if you think of that paradigm as a circle, I'm going to try and show that on the screen. And I haven't drawn this before. I was just thinking about it this morning. Our paradigm puts all of that over here, but the paradigm of the Netherlands is over here, right? Like they're just, that's the part that I really want to get to is, well, how do we shift that paradigm completely away from where we are? Um, And I want to talk about China in a moment to explain that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was blown away um, by that image in your presentation at uh, Velo City uh, of the orgware software or the hardware software and orgware. For years, I've been talking about, you know, uh, hardware activity assets and software activity assets and, and, and using that as an analogy. But then, you know, it made so much sense to see the orgware part of that. And, and it was neat to, to see that in your presentation as well. I did want to emphasize something that is really, really important about this slide and the this paradigm uh, of a deep rooted human approach is the fact that, you know, zooming in on this, I like this part right here of taking cars out of our mind. One of the one of the sort of catchphrases that has come up recently, especially out on bike Twitter is car brain. (laughs) <laughs> and people talking about, oh, this is another great example of car brain. And so I love that he honed in on this here. Of we need to do take you know cars away from our minds and on our streets in the sense that, yes, yeah, so much of what we end up dealing with is because we've been almost brainwashed into believing that cars will always be ever present in our life. At, at, at such a, an amazing level that we do end up having this this concept of car brain where it's like, 
well, what about the cars? <laughs> so it's it's really, really cool to see, you know, more and more people are, are honing in on that because I do think that that's a, a, a critical aspect. The other thing I wanted to zoom in on here too is uh, this bike is uh, a Christiana bike. And so this is uh, manufactured right there in uh, Copenhagen. And they have a version of this bike uh, that is used to take elderly individuals out so that they can get, you know, fresh air and be able to experience, uh, you know, life after they've lost some of their mobility. And, uh, and it's called Cycling Without Age is the international organization that does that. And so they have a version of this bike, which is a little bit wider so that two people can sit up front and then a pilot uh, who's you know cycling uh, behind can take them out and get some fresh air. And I think that's another thing that is part of what we're talking about here of, you know, giving ourselves a deep rooted human approach. I mean, there, to me, there's nothing more human than being able to give somebody the opportunity to get some fresh air and be able to enjoy the outdoors. And uh, especially if otherwise they would be indoors and in, immobile. So I just wrote that brought a big smile to my face when I saw that. Yes. And we do we do have the cycling without age here in Australia as well. Yay. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Now, this is kind of interesting because we're, this is what you're really talking about here is we need to be thinking you know, rethinking our streets and you're, you're framing it here of, you know, from the outside in. Yeah, it has lost a little part of the image on the right, but that's okay. Um, essentially, I think we can bring them in. Yeah, here we go. Oh yeah, that one there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Um, yes, that's the one. Yeah. So basically uh, I'd read just before going to Velo City, a blog by Robert Wheatman and the, the blog post was on, I want my street to be like this. And so the image in the bottom left hand uh, side there is from his blog. And he was talking about, um, I mean, I'm an architect. I've been studying this stuff and working in this stuff for 30 years and I'd never thought of the street like this. Um, so he talked about thinking of streets from the outside and that's the Dutch approach. We think of the streets from the inside out. So we go, you need two lanes of traffic in each direction. Then we need the parking. Um, then we put the curb line. So everything that's inside the curb line, it's all asphalt. And that's going to be where the cars go. They're either moving or they're parked. There's no space there for pedestrians and bikes and trees and so on. They go on the outside of all of that. Um, they, they get whatever's left over. And um, he talked in this blog about flipping that the whole other way around. So you have your building line, the, the blue on the outside. Um, so that, that plan there on the right is my very bodgy diagram of what we see in the perspective there in the photo. So they think about the street first, that the blue um, where the buildings are, then they put the space for uh, the pedestrians. And then um, in this case, it's a, a very slow street. So they don't need separated cycling infrastructure, but you would then put your cycleways in. Then they would put in where the trees and the parking go. And then they finally um, have some space for the vehicle movement. And in this case, it's room for one direction of traffic is left. Um, but also the, the line of the street, you can see it sort of flashing in that photograph there. The, the line of the street is quite wobbly. It's not, um, whereas ours would be, you know, as I said, the curb line and all the asphalt that's black that sort of sits in between is all for cars. Here, the space for cars actually moves in and out. And so it creates uh, what, what we like to call a self-reinforcing environment. It forces you to slow down as a motorist. And that means that you can make this um, a space where the car is a guest and the riders have um, are predominant. And so I just, it was a, a real paradigm shift for me. It was like, wow, I never conceived of that. And as I was walking around the Netherlands, I really had this in my mind, looking at every street going, it is, it, yeah. it fits, it fits, it works. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that was really mind blowing for me. So this brings up uh, Bondi again, of you know that transformation that took place there because the, the stuff that was on the inside, you know, if the, the motor vehicle lanes, since there was that commitment that we can't, you know, upset, the motor vehicle drivers and the throughput of motor vehicles, you know, again, everything off to the outside was, you know, left over. And then you end up having uh, trade-offs and, um, and basically pedestrians lost out because, you know, trying to squeeze in uh, some cycling infrastructure in limited resources. Whereas if, you know, this 
was applied in that in that environment and said, okay, let's wipe the slate clean here and let's reimagine what this this streetscape could look like for Bondi. It could have looked much differently. Absolutely, um, and that's where I wanted to talk about China because I guess the next question that came up for me is, um, is it even possible to do this paradigm shift? Like, is there Anywhere in the, I know that Paris is going through this at the moment. Paris is uh, under Anne Hidalgo, as you mentioned, um, they're taking a lot of parking space for cars. They're putting those on their, their the corners of their streets. They're putting in bike parking and trees and those sorts of things. And the scale is amazing. Like I was in Paris in January and um, one morning I uh, woke up and was sitting outside the Airbnb and watched as this um, a van pulled up and three people hopped out in their um, work gear and they literally worked for two hours, absolutely no traffic control. We'd never never even dreamed of that in Australia. We'd have to have so much traffic control. Um, <laughs> and they got out and they got some yeah. paint and they painted a wider footpath right into the roadway. Um, right. And then they left. And yeah. suddenly the footpath has doubled in width. Right. That just blew my mind. I was like, yeah. we, we can't do that. Wait, that that's like, wait, ridiculous. Wait, wait, wait. What was that? <laughs> what, was the, what just happened? Uh, and here we are. You, you've doubled the footpath yeah. with right like that, and it's only cost you know uh, uh, whatever the cost of the workers and the paint was, and that was it. Whereas right. here would be like, oh well, we've got to go through community consultation for several years. We're going to have some NIMBY complaining about it, and then you know then we're going to have to do traffic control, and then we're going to have to get the move the, the stormwater, and fifteen million dollars later. You're that's, done. And, um, and that's our reality in North America as well, is you have to go through each and every one of those steps. And that's one of the things that one of the things I caution about is you know, using Paris as an example. It's a very, very unusual example where you have a truly strong leader, a strong mayor who has just said, this is what we're doing. And she's doing it and she's following through. Not everybody's happy about it. Um, you're, there's some people who are mad, very mad, <laughs> to, as Rodney was saying, um, but they're pu- pushing through. And, and I, I, I really applaud that level of leadership. And I hope it inspires more leaders to, to see what true leadership looks like, uh, because she's unapologetic about it. She's like, you know, in 2015, when I was there to see the very first car free day in Paris, she said, look, we're doing this because we have a problem. If we can't see the Eiffel Tower through the smog, you know, we are not Paris. This is not the city yeah. we know. And so it's, yeah. it's, it really kind of hones in on the existential crisis that exists because cars have been allowed to take over. Uh, and again, there, still, there will be cars. We're not saying you won't be able to drive at all, but at the same time, it's not gonna be the same level of unlimited access. Okay, talk China. What's going on with this? Why are you so, so jazzed? So China, yeah. I mean, uh, China makes Paris look tiny uh, in in what it's changed. So um, uh, I really, you got the the um, link up here. Um, we did a presentation with um, AITPM, so that's our Institute of uh, Traffic Planning Management, um, and also with uh, Better Streets there, Cycling Walking Australia, New Zealand, um, and We Ride. So we did this joint presentation. We got someone who um, is works for the World Bank, Sam Johnson, who had just spent two months in China looking at what Beijing and Tianjin are doing. And um, I, I can't even remember any of the stats because uh, we just spent we spent a whole day in Canberra talking to the federal government, going through his presentation multiple times, and then I heard it here. But the numbers are so mind blowing that I can't actually retain any of that data in my head. Right. Um, right. So he was talking about things like, um, you know, it, they. Um, refurbished 3,200 kilometres of cycleways in four years. Mm. Um, another stat is that they've decided that, so that every single street in, um, in a very large area, about a, a 20 kilometre diameter area, every street that is 12 metres or wider is going to have a cycleway put in, in each direction right. of three metres in each direction. So that's going to leave just one lane of moving cars in each direction or a one lane of car and one lane of parking. Like 
that's just on a scale that we can't even conceive of. Right. Um, and I guess that China um, up until the late 1980s was um, probably had about a 50% mode share of cycling. So it was right. a very much a cycling dominated cities, but then they changed all of that and they were like, no, nah, we don't want the bikes. Um, they're blocking the traffic. We want to have cars moving and buses and trucks and we're going to invest in the metro stations. And so they put all the investment in that. And I think what's happened recently is uh, very, very recently is they've realized that that doesn't work. So right. from a purely economically rational and I guess spatially rational um, reasons, they've gone, hey, actually the solution is bikes. They were right in front of us all along. All so they've along. got very low mode share of cycling, but their ambition is they're going to be the Netherlands in 10 years time. And they're going to get there. I, at this I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful story uh, that's not dissimilar to the the story of the Dutch, in the sense that uh, especially the 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 story of uh, Rotterdam in particular, uh, which was destroyed in World War II and then rebuilt based on the car, and then realized afterwards that oh yeah. That was the wrong thing to do, <laughs> you know, and now they're transforming their streetscape in Rotterdam to be more people oriented and, and making more people oriented places, including more pedestrian realm and more protected bikeways. I think the same thing, you know, clearly has happened in China in the sense that, yes, you know, it was amazing the uh, the number of people who used to, to, to cycle throughout China. I mean, it was the one relevant thing that people would comment about if they were, you know, traveling there in the eighties is, oh my gosh, there's just so many people riding bikes, but it had to be incredibly embarrassing when, you know, you've built out these motorways and you've invested, you know, literally trillions and trillions of dollars in, in building out highways and, and everything. And then you have multi-day gridlock, which happened I don't know, about a decade ago or whenever that was. And so I think it really was, uh, to your point, that they learned that, oh, yeah, this doesn't work, <laughs> you know, and they are quickly, yeah. you know, they're, ba they're quickly backpedaling or more importantly, to put it, phrase it in a much more positive way, just like the Dutch, they tried it, didn't work. They're, they're, they're you know, re retooling and, and going in a different direction. And... I'm very, very excited that, to hear you, you had, you, yeah. you had that take that they're doing it. And obviously because of their governmental structure, um, they don't have to go through all the open house meetings and all the deliberations and, and talk, they can just plow forward and do it. In some ways, yes. But actually, if you listen to the webinar, you'll find that it's mm -hmm. not that easy. Like it's not just something mm -hmm. where they've been able to just decree from the top down, it's done. Um, okay. It has taken a huge amount of advocacy um, and it has required the, um, actually some of their biggest advocates are the public transport network providers. So the metros, uh -huh. because they were finding that um, people couldn't walk or cycle to their metro station because yeah. it wasn't easily accessible. So right. they've been some of the biggest advocates for this change to happen. So it's it's not just been a, um, a completely dissociated um, decision. I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you corrected that uh, incorrect uh, assumption that I had there because now that I think about it too, there's a huge automobile industry that's behind yeah, there in China. Absolutely. And so I'm sure that there's tensions between uh, you know, just like what we saw in, in Germany, where you've got a very, very strong automobile manufacturing culture there in Germany, but you have cities that are striving to become more walkable and bikeable. There's a, a natural tension there because there's money to be made in selling more automobiles and more motordom infrastructure. So I, it, it is, I appreciate you said that, that, you know, it's not as easy as just decree and do. Yeah. Um, but mostly, most important for me is that their paradigm was motordom. Their paradigm was was the big metros and so on. That's where the investment's gone. And they've suddenly gone, wait a minute, we can change this. And I, that's the part where I think we in Australia and New Zealand and the US and, you know, all all over the world can think, well, okay. And, and look, I, I, we did come and present this um, – this presentation on China um, to some some bureaucrats in in another department, and they didn't even ask questions. They just launched straight into excuses about why we can't, you know, um, heritage election cycles, NIMBYs. Like I don't know, they're just the litany of excuses. Um, but actually, 
and they one of them was oh they've got a different system of government and I'm like well that, okay that that's the case but then there is a more similar system of government in Europe and yet we also come up with excuses about why well, you can't be them like it's not government is not the problem uh, our system of governance or our election cycles or um, yeah whether we've got a car industry all of those are not the reason yeah yeah the, the reason yeah. is we just have a car brain and we don't want to give it up um, <laughs> exactly yeah that's, that's <laughs> why um, but we you know there are examples like Paris like Ghent like the Netherlands um, London you know they're really moving along oh yeah thank I'm glad you put this one up because I put this diagram together I'm, I'm, I'm it's a work in progress at the moment is uh, on the left-hand side, we've got our current knowledge, our standards and guidelines, much of which has been brought from um, the US or the UK. We have these business as usual practices, but behind that, our subconscious thinking is this car-dominated worldview, the, the car brain, um, where bikes and pedestrians are just a side issue. And the result, the result is always going to be the same. We, we cannot change the result if we've got those, that current knowledge and that current subconscious thinking. Um, and so I guess that's kind of how do we get to that new paradigm, that new way of thinking. Um, we do need new guidelines and policies, you know, tick, that's the software. Um, but that how do we change that subconscious thinking about actually the solution is people, bikes and public transport and cars are a last resort that's the last thing we think about um that's i, I don't know how we get there john I'd, I'd love to to hear from how we get to that point yeah i think you know a, a big part of it is is trying to tell these stories i mean i i was so happy to see that you had uh plenty of time to stay in europe and and travel around and and, and do that i i, I was very, very grateful that in 2015, I was able to spend a month uh, going around to different countries and different cities. And uh, last year, I was able to hang out in Delft for three weeks as my home base and and then make side trips from there. And I think it's really, really important to, to just be immersed in it and, and get a sense of, of what it's like to live there. I think that one of the key things of being able to get to where we need to get to is for us to, to really acknowledge that a big part of this is like transforming our, our cities so that they are a more livable, uh, more welcoming place for everyone, all ages and abilities. And increasingly, it, it's I realize that because we're so scripted in thinking about fixing the, the car problem, that we go towards active mobility of like the, that busyness of getting to places. And, and I think that that's part of it. I mean, active mobility is, is, is a big part of, uh, the, the solution in, in other words, it's a very pragmatic, very practical, sustainable mode of transportation. But increasingly what I'm seeing is how do we transform our cities into places where we're not always flowing through them? We're treating our cities like pipes of, of you know, well, we're busy people. We got to get to places. And it's like, well, yes, that's true. But streets are so much more than that. Streets are for people and, and, and for the platform for building wealth and, and vitality and vibrancy. And so that kind of shifts the paradigm or w of what streets are for. And, and I think it's, it, that's much more possible if we're not just thinking of streets as pipes and trying to move as many motor vehicles through as possible. Yeah, it's interesting. When we first started down this path of movement in place, so that's that rebalancing of, of the movement against the, the place outcomes, um, uh, the very first step that I saw the transport agencies take is to say, um, okay, well, how do, we, how, do we, how do we measure what place is? I know it's because cars are parked. <laughs> It's like, no, 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 that is not a measure of a good place. A measure of a good place is that there are people lingering, staying, lingering, enjoying. That is your number one indicator of a successful place. Um, and I can see here, yes, uh, that's one of the hardware parts, but um, uh, COVID was a real opportunity for us. I think that did bring about a pretty big paradigm shift for us. Um, I just want to say in the context in Australia, we've we've literally now just started to come out of four years of national disaster, like non-stop national disaster. So before COVID hit, we had bushfires, um, much like you're getting in Canada right now. 
Um, Sydney was covered in smoke for I think three or four months straight. Like you could not see the Sydney Opera House. Um, you could not see the ocean. The ocean was covered in ash. Um, it was it was horrendous, um, and we couldn't get masks. And then and that happened for months on end. And I thought you know things are going to change now. Like surely people understand this is climate change driven, which which they did. Um, but then COVID hit, uh, which and then then floods hit, and then the the places that have been burnt out um, uh, had huge floods, and the trees that all died, so there was no roots, and so houses have sort of slid down the mountainside. Um, and so we're only just emerging from that now, and I hope that that brings about paradigm shift, but I I don't think so. But anyway, let's come back to the uh, the, the this fun stuff, which was yes during COVID, um, hundreds of cities around the world took this massive leap of faith into creating space for people. Um, and there is a great um, website, uh, Space for Health, with a, with a Twitter and Instagram and so on, which I actually ran during COVID, um, which was was looking at examples all around the world that had, that had changed. Um, and here in Australia, we put in pop-up cycleways. So we went from taking nine years to deliver a cycleway to nine months. Um, we put in all these outdoor parklets. Um, we did these open streets. We made those pedestrian beg buttons. You didn't have to press them anymore. Unfortunately, we've gone back to that. Um, and we changed business as usual completely. So this was a very exciting time, in, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, that were really, really hard hit by COVID lockdowns. Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, that that's really when we're we're looking at this concept of this slide here says happy citizens. You know, what, what, what we need to do to, to be able to, to acknowledge that um, having freedom of choice of mobility options, not feeling like the only way to get around is to be able to, is you have to get in a car. I think it really does, you know, create an environment where you can have happier citizens. I mean, we all know the data shows that, you know, active mobility, people who walk or bike, are much happier and much healthier and have lower stress levels. And so it it's just one of those things where, uh, again, trying to lean in towards having really authentic, legitimate, safe and inviting all ages and abilities, mobility choice, that's freedom. You know, that's, that's real freedom, not being, you know, kind of tied to the automobile is the only choice. Yeah, that's right. Um, and just in these images here, um, it's a bit hard to see, but there's a there's mm -hmm. a lady in the top left hand corner, and she's got an L plate on the back of her bike. Okay, I just love that. Yeah, um, yeah. And and on the right is someone who's living with a disability, and like, look at the smile on his face. Like he's yeah, just yeah. loving this new infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> he he came to one of our pop up cycleway openings, um, and just the sheer joy and happiness it just opened up worlds for him. And then yeah. on the bottom right is actually my seven year old son. Uh, he was seven at the time and after watching him go up and down this new piece of infrastructure I was like you know what kid you can do that on your own you don't need me to be alongside yeah. to protect you because that cycleway infrastructure is going to protect you so yeah that was yeah. that was a fantastic time for us that's and, that, and all that's, those cycleways yeah. have been made permanent now they have oh wow that yeah. is so cool that is so cool what haven't we talked about that you really want to emphasize I guess um uh, it depends, John, whether you want to go here on a paradigm. I, I think it's a little controversial. So whereas Australia and the US are very similar with our car brain, so our paradigm is, is pretty much identical on that, there is one where we have a very different paradigm on, on guns. So, you know, that there is a, a gun brain in the US that um, I know this is very controversial, so you may not want to go there, but I guess I just wanted to compare that um, Australia was going down the path of the US with gun, you know, um, gun ownership until uh, a, a point in 1996 where we had a, a massacre, 35 people were killed, and we had a very conservative government in at that time, and they decided to bring in gun control, and they 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 had a gun buyback scheme. They really cramped down and it was controversial and people got really mad. Um, and yet, and yet now we live in a society where we, we don't have guns, like no one has one. Um, I think something like three and a half percent of the population 
uh, has a has a gun, but they're very tightly controlled. But I guess that's to me that was a paradigm shift where we decided at that point, like there had to be a tipping point, something had to happen. But that's where I come back to this question about um, where we in Australia we've had the you know the fires, and you guys are going through that right now. You've got you know the smoke coming through New York, and people are really upset and saying this is climate change. Is that going to be enough? Is that is that what it's going to take or is it, you know, and Don't Look Up is a classic example of that where, um, you know, they've got the asteroid coming as the, as the metaphor. The, the asteroid is in our, is, it's entered our atmosphere with carburetor. Right. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. right? Yeah, it's yeah. right there and we can't yeah. see it. Well, and, and I guess the, and I, the, the analogy that I have is if we take some of the, the lessons that, uh, that we see from from Europe, uh, that really was their tipping point. It was their tr- their their inflection point in terms of changing direction. Post World War II, they were all in on the car. They were heading down that road in the 1950s, and 1960s, and into the 1970s. It was all about you know more roads, more cars, faster. But in the ni- 1970s, of course, they had that inflection point of the oil embargo hit. Um, there was the Kindermort m- movement in the Netherlands saying this is unacceptable. And so it really started to change that paradigm. The paradigm wasn't, oh, the car is mobility and freedom. It's like, oh, wait, there's negative externalities here. W- we just don't see it here in the United States. I mean, literally 115 people or more die every single day on our roads. That's the size of a medium-sized jet airliner crashing every single day, day after day. If it actually was a jet airliner, there would be congressional hearings, There, w- it would be front page news. It's just that because these are all, for the most part, individual crashes and occurrences that are happening, collisions that are happening. So it's onesies, twosies, threesies for the most part. If it's something more than that, usually it'll make the local nightly news. You know, God forbid if it's a bus that crashes and and children are involved, then you might get some people following up and saying, well, what were the safety measures? And But there's, you know, to get to your point, it's like, okay, well, what is that tipping point? Is 115 people, you know, per day dying, not enough to create a tipping point, 40,000 plus people a year. Uh, Not to mention literally in the United States, millions of people having life altering serious injuries because it's not just the fatalities. It's also, you know, the fact that many of these people have truly life altering, you know, injuries uh, that they have to live with the rest of their lives. And it's still not enough. (laughs) So I don't know. It's, it's weird. We've been so truly, truly, brainwashed and car brain that it's, we accept yeah. it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, in Australia, our fatality is much lower, but that's because it, our population is much smaller. But um, people worry about going to the beach because they're going to get eaten by a shark, right? People avoid, some people don't want to go in the water. But um, in Australia, we have at maximum, we might get three shark fatalities in a year but we have 1,300 road fatalities in a year. Um, and as a, to put that analogy together, um, in my street um, a few months ago, a woman was killed. Um, she was just standing on a driveway and two um, drivers passed each other. You know, I don't know the circumstances, but one of them came off and killed her, right? And um, the street was shut down for about an hour while the ambulances and police came along. By comparison, and, and then the, you know, there's there's nothing we can do to fix this problem. It's just, it was a terrible freak accident and uh, we're just going to put some tube counts and um, I, don't, I just don't know what we can do about this. On the other hand, a, about a year ago, someone was killed by a shark, um, the same area, and we shut every single beach down for 24 hours We put out helicopters, drones were deployed. We come up with a whole new technology system to um, to do shark spotting and change the system, right, to try and reduce the risk of shark fatalities. Um, And I was thinking, well, what if we did that? What if we actually said, you know, any street where there's a pedestrian is killed, um, we're going to shut the street down, launch a massive investigation. We're not going to let up until it's fixed. And, you know, maybe we'll let, right, bring in a 30-kilometre street zone, so like we're going to do real action. What if we did that? Right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we could go on and on and on. We could. <laughs> um, I, I want to end uh, with a, 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 on an up note here and, and end with a, 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 a sort of a plea here for the, the uh, uh, for Sydney being able to host the uh, 2026 uh, Velo City. Uh, so this is the second to the last uh, slide. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, this uh, royal, royal support. Royal who? Ah, well, yes, it's it's our Princess Mary. Um, so Mary, who is the Princess of Denmark, is actually an Australian. She's from Tasmania. Oh, and she okay. was visiting Australia uh, and she hopped on a bike and went for a bike ride with the, the Lord Mayor of Sydney. Um, and here she is riding through. She had to wear a helmet, which I think she was um, a little bit mortified about because it kind of ruined the hair a little. But um, I guess I added this an example of the orgware where yes. um, you've got your hardware, the infrastructure, the software, yeah. the guidelines. And then here is the the orgware that the um, it's safe enough in tiny little section that we could bring a, a royal yeah. to come for a bike ride on our brand new infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you and I chatted in, in Leipzig at, at VeloCity a little bit about helmets and, and, and all of that and the, the challenges that that presents from, from the software side of things. Uh, but we also, uh, I also mentioned to you, I think that, uh, that we had a, uh, uh, queen Maxima uh, join us. Uh, the Queen of the Netherlands was here in Austin uh, to go for a bike ride. And so uh, I was delighted to be able to film her along with our mayor uh, at the time, uh, Steve Adler. And uh, she jumped right on to her uh, 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 Hazella uh, electric bike and uh, the two of them rode off without helmets. <laughs> <laughs> So experience it yourself. Yes, I would love to come to uh, Sydney. You and I had talked about this as well at Velo City. I have never visited. I've always wanted to to go to Australia and New Zealand uh, to make it down into that area. I'm actually a lifelong surfer, so I've always dreamt of being able to surf some of the uh, classic spots there uh, in Australia, and hopefully that will happen. And, uh, and folks, if you'd like to, uh, complete that survey, I think this little, little dude right here, if you, uh, if you hit that, it'll, uh, if you actually use your camera, you'll, uh, launch that. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And Yay. I guess what we wanted to look at if, if it did come to Sydney is, um, there are so many cities around the world where we don't have it great. And so we really wanted to focus on, well, what do we do for all those cities? How do we do that paradigm shift? Um, right. We really want to bring in the Chinese examples, um, examples from the Asia Pacific area, because we didn't hear a lot about that in the um, in Velo City when it's based in Europe. We hear all about the awesome stuff happening in Europe. Um, but we'd like to hear more about um, what happens in the global south and in Asia Pacific region. Yeah, and, and I went to this particular title slide here of, of your presentation uh, because you get to the point with that. It, you know, Sydney was Australia's worst place for cycling not too very, very long ago, and uh, good things have been happening very quickly. Yes, that's right. We've got a long way to go, but I think um, we definitely did go from a, a pretty bad situation to being much, much better in a pretty short space of time. And that's, I guess, the kind of stories that we want to share is how do you shift that dial from a very low base? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really, really important. I mean, that's one of the things that I've been trying to do with the Active Towns uh, initiative over the past decade is trying to tell the stories, the inspiring stories of cities making change happen. Because it, it's like, oh, hum, yeah, we don't want to hear about Amsterdam again and again and again. You know, if they're a city that's out there around the globe, uh, you want to hear, you know, the success stories of, you know, this sort of transformation in seven years. That's, yeah, that's exactly. what is really inspiring. Yes. I love it. Love it. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a, a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Sarah Stace. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador through Patreon, buy me a coffee, uh, buying things from the Active Towns store, you know, like 
please. <laughs> Actor Towns, streets are for people swag that's out there, uh, as well as you can make a donation to the nonprofit. Uh, it's all out on the Active Towns website, so activetowns.org. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.